It all happened around Dale Dayton, the sixth largest city in the state of Ohio, and the country's seat of Mahogamary Country. A small part of the city extends to Green Country. The 2018 U.S. Justice estimate about the city population at 140,640 the, the people, while Greater Dayton was estimated to be around, around, around almost 1 million residents. This makes Dayton to be the fourth largest metropolitan area in Ohio, and the 63rd third in the United States. Dayton was actually Ohio's Miami and Valley region, just north of the greater Cincinnati. Ohio's borders within the 500 miles, roughly through 60% of the country's population and manufacturing structure, making Dayton an area of the nostalgical centroid for the manufacturers suppliers and shippers and Dayton also hosts significant research for development in the heel fields like industrial, aerostarnal, and astronautical engineering that may lead to technical in motivations, such as a motivation due to the part of Wright, Wright Patterson Air Force Base and place in the community. Within the decline of heavy manufacturing, Dayton's businesses have diverse into an economy that includes insurance of legal sectors as well as healthcare and government sectors. Along with the defense of the actual space, healthcare accounts for much of the Dalton's area of economy. Hospitals in the greater Dalton have been estimated to be combined of employment of nearly 32,000 and yearly economic impact of the $6.8 billion. It estimated that Premier of the Health Partners and the Hospital Network contribute, says, more than $200 billion in a year to region throughout the opening, employment, and operating in the capital expenditures in 2011. Dayton was rated the third in the city nation by the health grades for excellence and in healthcare. Dayton is also noted for the association with fiction and the city in the home in the National Museum of the United States Air Force and the birthplaces Orenville Wright, other well-known individuals that were born in the city, including poets Paul Lawrence and Dunbar and the entrepreneur near John H. Patterson. Dayton is also known for its many patients, since inventions and even inventors, and most notably for the Wright brothers in the invention of the powered fright. In 2007, when Dayton was part of the part of the top top 100 cities in America in 2008 and 2009, as well as 2010. The site selection magazine ranked Dayton to be number one mid-sized metropolitan in an area in the nation of economic development. Also in 2010, Dayton was named for one of the best places in the United States for college graduates to find a job. On Memorial Day of 2019, Dayton was affected by a tornado outbreak which had a total of 15 tornadoes touched down Dayton area. It was half a mile when EF4 that tore through right in through the heart of the city, causing damage. We were about to spend our summer vacation at our grandparents' house, knowing that Granddad used to be an animator back in the 1950s. While there, we chatted about certain things, like we, had, we used to work and how we got the job and what event he used to unfold back around the 1930s five. Unlike Grandad's inhuman personality, there was a gray guy named Joe Jones, and he was financial and rather mentally unstable, as well as somewhat psychotic and unhinged to the point of worshipping the character Lazo the Cat and his savior, offending and offering him the, the sacrifices to please him in the method of the similar to satanic rituals. Joe did not appear homicidal in this matter with the recordings, but appears to be have have become maddened by the unnatural corruption prior to Grandad returning to the workshop 30 years after being part of the hospital due to collusion with a drunk driver. Joe seems to suffer from severe memory loss or dementia. He had been shown to suddenly forget that he was talking about in mid-sentence, so he could no longer remember the significant other or even the color of his hair. The only thing he can almost remember was Grandad. He felt so similar to holding him back by looking at his face and besides calling him a sheep. The place Grandad worked was at Swan Animations, founded by Brian and Gregory Swan, an unknown fall date in the other year of 1959. Swan Animations was located to an unknown location of the Ohio State, having work hours from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. 
the corpor corporation is known for the biggest place where the animator by the name of Kurt Lashley spent his entire lifetime there, animating a logo and use for his work and his bosses. The Swan Brothers making Lazo cartoons as well as many other animators. But however, sometime in 1930, Kurt left the company and moved to New Orleans, Louisiana to spend more time with his wife, Brianna. One year, year later, to keep the company strong and alive, the Swan Brothers decide to hire several workers and eventually the voice talent to collaborate with Kurt. During World War II, the studio re-released many of its early cartoons to sell war bonds. Many of them the Swans have worked it into drafts in the United States, armed forces to get fight with the war itself. Brian became even more open to hiring women to work for him in the addition to men, since he was desperate for his new hires, while Kevin was attempted to make profits with the idea of, say, of making food products with Lazo on them. In 1944, due to excessive spending on the Swans' part, in order to find the then the upcoming Lazo Land project, the studio then began facial and financial decline, automatically resulting in the Swans to enforce their stricter rules for employees in order to keep his company from going out of business. In 1946, Swan Animations was under investigation after reports of hazardous work environments, missing employees, harassment, and excessive back pay, as well as the company's danger of being bankrupt. With all the results that were of the Swan's mismanagement of the studio, anonymous employees threatened to make labor unions over the poor conditions in which over unpermanent buildings, hazardous electrical wiring, and a plumbing system prone to for the busting. In the addition, there was excessive work hours, in which they were unpaid and several animators were unable to unsee their families in weeks. After being threatened with the disciplinary action of the determination, if they were able to finish the animations tight in schedules, they were going to be reports of barricaded offices, employees, and locked up in workplace spaces. The complaints of crazy manufacturing machinery, despite the evidence against the company, the brothers remained from that firm studio that has done nothing wrong. Calling the accusations and proposers and ridiculous dismissing them as rather complaint and mental employees or free bill attempts by completing the studios with crediting the Swans. On August 16, 1959, a new law was formed as the Black Wolf sued over the Swan Brothers for having heard of rumors of their mismanaging of their own workers. Twelve days later, the studio was closed down in accordance to a legal regulation in 11 U.S. Code, code was forbid to be misperception of the legal established companies as evident by the bankruptcy report found in the brothers in the apartment, as well as the health and safety concerns, concerns directed by the mention of the health and safety board meeting schedule found in the appointment lobby. Three years later, in the present of 1963, at the beginning, my granddad receives a letter from the Swans, saying that they would come back to the workshop later as they wanted to hire him, as he was a good artist at his own studio, regular studios. Granddad revisits the studio only to find the abandoned due to him being nearly defunct. Thought though that the Legament studio, it was revealed to be an endless cycle. Every single area of establishment locations was merged into one word. It was revealed by the two brothers. How is this possible, but how? And thus Granddad been, have been working for them outside since. Oh, and as for the workers there, it turns out they're still alive, just doing their normal routines. And as for crazy old Joe Jones, who is revealed to be the mystic conductor and writer of the soundtrack that Grandad still has to this day, this guy may be a lunatic, but he does have a musical taste. As I listen to the soundtrack, from the tape recorder Grandad has on this dresser in his office, I could safely say that whatever cartoon this is, in my opinion, like Felix the Cat and Spongebob, mixed with a blender, and since the cartoon reminded me of Bendy and the Ink Machine, which I don't have, it gave me a nostalgic feeling of warmth and joy whenever I look upon the happy-to-go lucky cat's, cat's calm and caref carefree face. The character Lazo the Cat, like I said before, or has an appearance entirely colored in black apart from the lower side sides of his face and upper chest, which is colored in grayish-white. He wears a shiny black shoes and a pair of gloves that slowly resembles that of the other cartoon characters, like Mickey Mouse and some even processing to two black buttons. He even does have a, doesn't have a tail for some reason. I guess that that's how he created him. 
as his friend goes here as he follows. A dog that is colored in the same manner with a cozy sea country similar to Goofy. A male pig who is an opera singer. A white mouse who is a beautiful female of the group who is in love with Laszlo. And finally a silverback gorilla who is the main antagonist of the show. He's like Bluto from the Popeye shorties, shorts, but he's Brutus consensus of causing nothing but trouble for the main protagonist. Now Grandad does have some few reels in his office, but only a couple. I'm not sure what the remaining reels are, but they do look like to be in one condition. Shin, and find one at that. Even though it's been years since Grandad worked in the Swan Animations, according to the reels, Lazo had been in the borderline troublemaker, forever a patient and easily startled to timid, yet just Justified, cheerful, as fun-loving and mischievous as his feline nature would simply grow. Lazo even refuses to pay anything for the boy he buys. He tries to take his burger without paying in the Burger Boy Blues. He didn't even pay for a roller coaster Ronald for his ride. According to the later bio, according to Granddad, while Lazo was can be playful, he is not evil, and his jokes were never spirited. As Lazo, who is the attention-seeking, easily distracted. He is never hardworking or courageous. Just said fact. I was also mentioned by my granddad that there was a kid named Tommy Harley who had just been moved from our hometown in Williamsburg, Virginia, around 2015. He was reported missing after he just went to, with his older brother for Fred to, to cook out. He was last time seen with the fry, Fred on their way to a bunch of kids. It's who they've known since around the neighborhood at the Ohio Valley Coal Company in an old mining facility where people can collect coal with machinery or other tools. Brandad told me that he was was over on his daily newspaper at the time and his parents had, had heard that Tommy was diagnosed with ADHD and autism and Asperger's syndrome and he was about three years old. If anyone out there doesn't know what Asperger's syndrome are, Asperger's syndrome or simply Asperger's is previously used diagnosis with autism spectrum back in 2013. The name of the part of the umbrella diagnosis of autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, and the Dynastic, and, and Satisfactory Manual for Mental Disorders by Five, Asperger's Syndrome, and previously other separates of autism unfolded into one of the umbrella diagnoses of autism dum, dis spectrum disorder. In this, when you meet someone with who has Asperger's Syndrome, you might know two things off. He's just smart than the other folks, and he has more trouble with social skills. He also tends to have obsessive focus on a topic or perform by he behaviors over and over again. The doctors used to think Asperger's was a separated condition, but in 2003, it was the newest edition that's standard by the book that mental health experts use, called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Mental Disorders, to change how it's classified. Today, Asperger's syndrome is technically no longer a diagnosis on him, it's now part of the border category called Autism Spectrum Disorder. This group related mental health issues shares some of the symptoms. Even so, lots of people still use the term Asperger's. The condition is what the doctors call as high functioning name type of ASD. This means the symptoms have the less severe of the different kinds of Autism Spectrum Disorders. It also includes a new diagnosis called Social Pandemic or Communication Disorder which is some symptoms that overlap the Asperger's. Doctor uses it to describe people who are having talk, trouble talking and writing, but have a normal intelligence. They start early in life. If you are a mom or a dad or a kid of a kid who has it, you may have noticed that they don't make, can't make eye contact, so you may have to find that your child is in awkward social situations, doesn't even know what to say or how to respond when someone talks to them. She, he, or may miss, miss social cues on obvious folks, some like the body language of the expressions of people's face, faces. For instance, he may not realize when somebody crosses their arms and scowls. He's angry and other signs that your child has a few emotions. He may not smile when he's happy or laugh at a joke, or he may speak in a flat robotic kind of way. Think about it for a second. If one of your siblings has the condition, he or may may talk to himself most of the time and zero, zero with the intensity of a single subject like rocks or football stats. He might even repeat himself a lot, especially on a topic that he's interested in. He might also find a way in the movements over and over. He also may dislike change. For instance, he may eat the same food for breakfast every day or having trouble moving from one class to another during the school day. After a while, me and my brother Jason decided to go search in a, in a party attempt to find Tommy. 
Even though Jason was planning on drawing anime characters in our room, he was urged on by our mother to cue on to the guilt, due to the guilt tripping over him into doing so. We got into our parents' car. Our parents let Jason drive the car after getting his driver's license, and we drive around looking for Tommy. After about many hours of walking around outside, calling Tommy's name, I found something shining on the ground by under the moonlight. I shined over my flashlight on it, and it was revealed to be an unwrapped bag of Sour Patch Exploders, my favorite candy. I knew Tommy had been around here, and judging by the scenery, it lo looked like he hadn't been caught and been finding the trash can when he was all alone eating the candy, so he threw it on the ground and continued to wander off. Jason, I called out, take a look at this. He walked up to me and looked at the small bag. We must be getting close. Keep looking. We walked over in the, through the darkness around town until we found ourselves was back on the road. We checked in the nearby road sign, and what do you know, we were on the Navy Avenue. We then saw some lights in the distance and walked over to see the sign. Ohio Valley Coral Company. The metal carts that held the coral was rusted and abandoned due to either the founder armament or getting fired or even the spread of, well, the pandemic. But either way, we are high heading over inside to continue our speech and search for Tommy. We must climbed up the fence and looked around the, at the fish facility. The bulldozers and multiple carts on the train tracks and the middle of the made them were absolutely haunting. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is the music playing over the intercom. I can't remember the song very well, but due to remember watching the old cartoons with Granddad while spending our summer vacation, it was a song on our way to Grand Peace from the Betty Boop. What the hell is that? Jason asked me. He looked at me and shows his face a little unnerved, but we shook it off the feeling. He knew it was a college student and he was better than to let his fears overcome him. It's Betty Boop, I replied. Someone must have old timey songs. Jason chuckled a bit. Yeah, who could have? Who was here, doesn't it? Can't say. I can't blame him for that. Since we're a couple of city boys, we usually hear heart friends from 21 Pilots or have my house from Florida. But the sound, but the radio at the gas stations or nearby Walmart. But this was completely out of the ordinary. Both of us were expecting a hulking troll of a man, dressed up as a clown, popping out of nowhere and chasing us with a chainsaw. But thankfully, nothing happened. Just the ominous surrounding of the coal mine, mine outside with the Betty Boop blasting from the speakers. We walked around the place, with the soles of our shoes colliding with the rocky dirt ground, till we saw the entrance of the tunnels that were of mine. They were made more creepier with the black drawings around the galloping maw of the tunnel, which had two bitch pitch black eyes just staring down at us from the teeth bared. Looking at the tunnel was about to swallow us whole, and the two black arrows were both sides of the entrance interior, pointed out the words such as, Come inside, and I'm dying to see you. From what, from what we were seeing, whoever made these writings on the wall was the person responsible for Tommy's disappearance. Come on, I said. It's time to get Tommy back. Whoa, 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 just a minute, Jason called out to me. How do you know that he's in there? He could be somewhere else rather than this grimy hole. You just know how an autistic kid are afraid of the dark. I know, I know, I replied. But what if Tommy wanted to explore here and got himself lost? We can't risk that chance. We have to save him before he practically starves to death. I mean, think about it. He's possibly at the point of eating rats to survive. Jason pondered about the thought and rolled his eyes and groaned. Fine, but stay close to me, okay? I nodded in agreement and went and we went inside, our flashlights shining around the walls of the tunnel. Just the looks of the mines that he that alone, you could see the claustrophobic, but the darkness was just in the ice on the cake. It was just so dark that you can't even see your best friend beside you, nor the sight of your own hands. The pitch blackness and the shadows seemed to be costume of the night of the light. The tunnels through the dear god. It seemed to be going on forever. If you were to go alone without the aid of the buddy, you'd be lost forever. You'd see no way out. No matter how much you scream for help, attempt to find some sort of exit, you'd be trapped in the darkness of cold. Concept of mine. The air would so send the dense that it would squeeze your lungs in opposition. The rays of our flashlights haste around, around the shadows like a similar swords words through paper as we ventured out through the coal mine. And for what seems to be like days on our end, we finally saw that the walls were now covered on top to bottom of countless black drawings of many fanes, and when I shone my flashlight over towards them, I recognized them. They were drawings of stick figures of children, playing one big anthropomorphic cat with big, bulging eyes with a wide, horrific smile. I looked at Jason, who was just seeing them too, and he saw his face. Pure, audetic shock. 
What the hell? He mouthed quietly to himself. He noticed me, looked at him, and I as well. Dude, I think we... Suddenly we heard a big loud clang that echoed across the halls of the tunnel, making us jump with our skin. Jesus, I yelped. We paused with and not moving a muscle. Tommy? Jason called out into the darkness. Tommy, you're in there? Nothing called out as well. Tommy, is that you making that noise? Again, still nothing. We looked at a bit of each other before making our way down the mine, still looking at the creepy drawings on the walls, and the rest was just my eyes, ghastly on its own right. The cat in the drawings seemed to be luring children in the abandoned places with the words, Get Out, written below it. Another bunch of trees with the black silhouette can be see a cat dead center in the woods. Don't listen. Above the drawing, we could finally see the cat walking hand to hand with two kids with no words around it. Just a drawing and nothing else. God, it's... It's like Slenderman, I stuttered. Jason just looked and shaking his head. This is just insane. This is where we finally saw the end of the deep, but mind-bulging long tunnel. And we walked out of the tunnel as we looked around. There where this area was huge, like if something out of the movie. The map we found on the wall was just the information we need. It was a storage room, the turbine room. The, the two stairwells leading up to the second floor, and a main room where it's the emergency elevator was located. We were in the main room. We ventured off into the main room until Jason found finds at least the, one of the generators next to the elevator. After activating the second generator, I realized we were being chased by a feral creature. Well, it sounded like a feral creature in the distance. We can hear it growls, grunts, and spinning river bend of walls on the halls that we tried to do avoid whatsoever chasing us as we ran up the stairs leading to the second floor. I saw what looked like a humanoid figure. Black hoodie, jacket, black sweatpants, and slipknot t-shirt. What made it all horrific was the fact that its hood was up. He wore a Felix the Cat shirt with a machete tightly gripped onto his, to his right fist. And that was made even more petrified was that the skin was white as snow, possibly due to being in the mines for years. Oh crap, I yelled in fright. Jason, Jason, run! Jason saw what I was looking at, and he was hysterical. We darted out of the rooms in the halls, licked over the barrels, and hid in numerous places. But we still managed, managed a maniac to keep hunting us down like a wild animal. We got lost, and we found ourselves in a turbine room. This whole room is where spines turn into jelly. In the corner of the room was a black handwriting wall as it follows. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and of our understanding. A spirit consists of strength and a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the, of the Lord. The delight shall be the fear of the Lord. One of our knees started buckling as we came down to the shocking conclusion. That was Tommy's handwriting. My jaw agape as as one of my eyes were became sized as pie pants. To my knees, knees and kneeled there what seemed to be like hours. And I didn't even know how long it had been since I stared up at the writing of the wall. But because my legs were asleep... My legs were completely numb and attempted to stand up, but the difficulty of walking, I limped towards the door of the turbine room and headed out to sit down in the hallway and slapped my legs together to consciousness. Thankfully, the masked lunatic was out of sight, and Jason thought it was just as stiff throughout the hours of texting our parents, telling them that we had found an encounter. How we got Wi-Fi down here was a riddle I can't or don't think anyone could solve. Harry, we need to leave now, Jason said. After my legs were fully conscious, I got back up and said, All right, let's go. As we made our way out of the halls, we got back up to the main room, and when we were, one more to get the hell out of this hellhole. With that being said, we stopped dead in our tracks as the sounds of a giggling and laughing of children rang in our ears. We did not stare to look back at first until our eyes moved towards each other. What was that? Jason asked quietly. I didn't say anything, but we both moved up our hands, hands over our shoulders to see. Moving in the darkness where groups of children ran up towards us from 6 to 17 years of age. They came over to every area of mine. Hell, they were even scaling around the walls and the ceiling like humanoid lizards. How the hell were they able to do that? I have no clue. If you've seen the scene from Willow, there is a Sasquatch looking like trolls that were crawling around the fortress walls while the main character that was just like that, but with kids. And all of them seemed to have the same white skin that the masked man had chased us in the asylum of escape. And what baffled us was just some sort of pale-skinned kids that were just not Caucasian, but it looked more like African-American, Hispanic, Asian, and even Indian. We even found out for some reason their complexion as we shined our flashlights to them, which made them flinch away and hiss like cats or snakes. 
We gasp as we, we saw it, the colorless mediocre of the all existence. From our skin, eye, or hair, or even including their clothing, the hissing didn't sound like human. It even sounded like an overwardly and almost demonic sense. They backed away from our flashlight sprays, covering their eyes and even attempting to swipe at us in an attempt to smack the flashlights off our hands. Suddenly, the elevator began to grind and shift, causing us to and the children to take off their guard to look at the elevator. Something was off. Indeed, it was coming down from the elevator and the children fled back into the darkness. Some of them were crawling back up to the walls to be mine, and we gazed at each other at the direction of the elevator as the creature was lifted to be revealed. By God, the thing that will forever haunt very haunt our dreams as we very lived. It resembled a giant black amphiphomorphic cat with extremely creepy smile filled with garled teeth that was rotten orange with its hands still covered in gloves, resembling the 30s cartoon character. Besides that, it was some sort of masked man, Still holding that damn machete, the creature appears to be about eight feet tall. It it towered towards us and the mask resolved and it stepped off, staring us in their unnerving grin. We beckoned on with us with the outstretched gloved hands, and then we looked at the mask man, who then walked up to us and shook his mask off. Yes, he took his mask off to reveal Tommy Harley. He looked horrific as hell. He looked like a simple ravenous elderich monster, instead of a normal everyday human being. Like with the rest of the kids, he was completely monocular. He was just large with black rings around his eyes, with a strange liquid of substance struggling down his mouth, speaking of which his mouth was worse. He had an extremely large mouth that was painfully stretched across his face, like a cartoon. His mouth was filled with teeth that was filled into sharp points, resembling tiny little daggers aligned with the blades of the chainsaw. He grounded and garnled at them as he foamed at the mouth, Black saliva jumped down from his gray lips as they hit the ground like wet ink. Oh, hell no! Jason yelled in fear as we made a break towards the exit. I've, I followed the suit and me and Jason ran down the tunnel at the four footsteps, echoing throughout the whole halls. We heard the monster hallowing after us as we spilled down the black tunnels towards the exit. I attempt to catch up to Jason, who is now like the fish at this flash at this point. Every time I look at the creature that was gaining on me, I quickened my pace and I could hear the clopping of the soles hitting the concrete floor. By then I was could feel the right on the air as my face and Jason and I were close to the exit. The next thing we know, we were already outside. We spent at the chained fence and the clouds and dust of steam were blowing at us and like we were bullets of a gun. Jason and I were climbing like crazy. As we climbed, I looked back to see how corrupted Tommy darting outside with the manic expression of a rabid dog with the giant creature behind him making its way out of mine. Lowering its back, the feline had, head had one of its gloved hands on the uh, held the upper side of the entrance and squeezed its way out. It also seemed hesitant to leave its territory, but in another way, it chased us nonetheless. Harry, Harry, come on! I can hear Jason's frantic voice beckoning me to pick up the pace. So I did so, and that's what I just did, and the creature just came out towards us like a juggernaut. I attempted my escape, but my foot was grabbed by Tommy, who was, who was trying to let saw my leg off with that machete. I yelled in pain as my leg was being being stabbed by like a piece of Thanksgiving turkey. I used all my might to cut him but to, to push that thing away from my face. It fell backwards and with the fud and I pulled myself over the chain fence and limped over a few meters away from the place. I fell forward and agonly called for Jason for help. I looked back in my terror and saw the beast was standing near the fence, his arms stretching and reaching for me for the giant two condiments towards me. They grabbed me and grabbed at the, uh, grabbed the grass and grabbing at anything to help me get away from its grasp. I cried out for Jason as much as I can, can until I heard the sound of the vehicle speeding my way in from the shadows. I saw the headlights flashing and as my face, Jason stepped, sped his car to a stop, pointed a shotgun at the thing's arms and fired it multiple times. Roaring in pain as the bullet struck its arm, Jason fired multiple rounds at the thing, causing it to retreat back into mine. Harry, get in the car, he said. I can't, I yelped, my leg. Jason picked me up and helped me back into the car as we sped down to Miami Valley Hospital. I woke up the next morning in the hospital bed with my gown provided by the doctors and nurses. My legs were injured and bandaged up with the cast. Sitting there in the chairs was my parents. Mom? Dad? I muttered. Yes, son, we're here, my mother said. How were you, you doing, champ? My father asked. Your leg doing okay? Well, it hurts like hell, but I'll be okay. Your brother told us that you, some psycho was attacking you guys, my mother said. Are you okay, sweetie? 
Yeah, and so is Jason, I replied. By the way, why is he here? Oh, yeah, I'm here, bro, Jason said as he stepped in. He was just coming back with some lunch from the cafeteria. By the way, I got us some pizzas. Oh, thanks, man, I said. The both of us were eating some pizzas and drinking sodas. As well as I did, I got some ginger ale. As well as our parents were talking to the doctor outside, Jason pulled up the chair beside me and asked, When were you, are you going to tell them? We can't, I replied. They won't believe us. They're just going to think we're some, we need to find some sort of evidence to back up on our chains. Or claims, for that matter. You mean, like photos or something? Jason asked. Yep, I answered. I have brought my video camera with me when we got there. Along with my charger. I might as well use it to document our search for answers. Good deal, he replied. But do you know when we'll be back? They'd be prepared, right? I highly doubt it, I said. They'd probably be in another location for a confrontation elsewhere. Underground, but we can't risk any more children going missing because of whatever this is. Yeah, that was scary, Jason uttered, and he thought of what happened last night. I know, ma'am, but we have to do this, or else they won't believe us that we've been attacked last night. Jason sighed a bit and both shook on it, agreeing it to this nightmare once and, and once and for all. As we got home a week later, we filmed each other in our grandparents' RV and chattered the viewers about the, the events we unfold. Especially with the whole thing bang about Tommy and the monster that corrupted him with these poor, unsuspected children. We spoke about that creature, what it looked like, and then when we brought it up with the fact that it was due to resembling Lazo the cat, the character I mentioned at the beginning of the article, brought up in a fury that it could have been a cosmetic and eternity of sorts, manifesting itself as Lazo the cat to lure innocent children to his lair and suck out their souls and drain them for the color so that they could be mindless flowers, serving them as the eternity and tells them where they would need to go or who tells them to kill is just like marble hornets. They were Tim and the hooded guy that could be Slenderman's proxies, but that work of fiction and this reality, it could be two possibilities. Be related in some way? I mean, think about it. This is the beginning of some sort of Stephen King territory. Here, like what I've been seeing about Pennywise in the town of Dayton, Ohio, being Derry, Maine. But what I mean is my brother saw that night it was worse than Pennywise, even scarier than him. We're now revealed the motives to be any viewer watching her show but or video, but it would be not active around the daytime. Let's just call it the Hunchman to do all the work, but around the nighttime, that's when they're most active. Luring children from their homes and trick them into believing that it's their imaginary friend. Until the coast is clear, it will reveal itself to them and then take the them to a plurgery. There it will stalk them for all eternity, or simply kill them off. When it wants to be more manipulative, it will have the children follow him to the hellish upload, and that's when they were inside. They were never heard from again. These are the accounts that we made about the creature's skin and eating children, and having their skin dry off and under the boiling sun. We don't know where it came from or where its plans are, but we're not going to let some sort of kids cough and rest on your minds. Before we ended the video, we wanted to say this in memory of Tommy Harley. Whatever this thing is, we're going to blow that son of a gun back to the pit of hell. And by God, we will not rest until, the, until it's good and dead. And Mr. and Mrs. Harley, if you're watching this, we're going to get your son back one way or another. We can rest assure you that whatever has happened to your son, it's not going to happen with us. This is for you, Tommy. This is for you all. And that, my little pretties, was Cartoon Cat Sketches, a cartoon cat creepypasta written by the Dark Cat. The Dark Cat, I have to say right now that I want to thank you so much for writing this story. So, with that being said, let me get on with this story. Now, I actually found this story to be rather disturbing because I remember seeing um, this on Shadow Reader's channel. Like, I remember listening to Shadow Reader's channel, you know, this story. And I gotta say, this was actually a very disturbing story. And this, despite the fact that this is about the cartoon cat, it's actually... Um, Pretty well done and made, if you can really ask me. Because when I saw this story, I was pretty disturbed by it. Because, you know, it was really creepy and, you know, the way that it was really done and stuff. So it was actually one of the way, reasons why it's actually pretty disturbing. In regards to the fact that the whole how the whole thing went out, it's just absolutely creepy. And crazy regards to that. Like, it's 
a very interesting concept. You know, all this is very freaky, don't get me wrong. It was automatically really freaky in regards to that. Like, oh my goodness, I nearly freaked out because this one actually was actually one of the freakiest ones I've ever seen. So I definitely have to say, Dark Cat, this one was a pretty freakish Actually, really well made story. Like, I have to say right now that the story itself was actually really well made. And not only that, the story was very well made and done. This is actually quite believable, if you ask me. I actually found this story to be rather believable in a sense. It's a really amazing, well done story. And it actually played out well with the whole concept in that. I do remember Shadow Reader narrated this back, you know, I think was... Sometime this year, actually, sometime. I remembered him listening listening to this narration. And with, to be completely honest, I actually... This story actually scared the crap out of me. Surprisingly, it did scare the crap out of me. So what I definitely have to do appreciate, Dark Cat, is the whole concept of the story of how it went out. It actually really fits out well with the story. That's definitely something I definitely have to say. Like, not a lot of creepypastas do this anymore. But it act, but this one, it actually flows out well with the story, and it definitely it plays a good part into this. So it's a really good concept. I can definitely say what I liked about this. Now I definitely do appreciate was the good grammar, the storyline of how it all went out, the sentence structure worked out nice, and basically everything about this story was just flat out amazing. I just really like the fact that this story actually played out well with the whole concept itself, like. Shadow Reader said this one was actually a pretty disturbing one. Well, I have to definitely say <laughs> this one was just equally as disturbing, but it was actually pretty good at the same time. So, that's definitely the good positive I have to say regarding to this story. So, <laughs> I'm definitely have to say right now, this story actually worked out really nicely in regards to the good grammar, the sentence structuring, and the storyline. So, definitely I have to say, if I have to anything in this do I have anything negative to say about this story? Um, surprisingly, no. I definitely have to say that this story actually worked out well, and it actually looked at amazing, sing and interesting concept for those who wanted to know what it is. So, of course, I definitely could definitely say that this story actually worked out well, and not only that, it actually was disturbing, really well made, and of course, I'm actually pretty the surprise about this story being a rather great concept. So, with that being said, my little pretties, um, I am going to keep the review as short as I possibly can. So, I am going to be wrapping up this review as best as I can with this story. But I definitely have to say, when I first heard Shadow Rear's narration of this story, I could really tell that this story was really disturbing. And I definitely have to say, this story is actually one of my favorites with the cartoon cat. I might read another cartoon cat story. If um, anyone could provide me another link or something. I will consider checking it out. But anyways. Um, let me wrap up this review as best as I can. Now like I'm going to say right now. And like I always continue to say. This is simply my own personal opinion. And if you disagree with me. That's fine too. We're all entitled to our own opinions. Regards to these uh, creepypastas. And this is simply my own personal thoughts. My final rating of this story would have to be a uh, 10 out of 10. It's great creepypasta, great concept, really disturbing to be completely honest. And this story actually flows out really well with the whole story. I definitely have to say, this story was actually pretty good in regards to that. And it was actually pretty amazing if you can think about this story for at least a bit. You could probably imagine how good this story actually really was. And so, with that being said, what did you guys all think about this story? Did you all enjoy it? Did you not? Also, what we have done personally to help make this story a lot better? Leave me now what your thoughts are down in the comment section down below. I'm the Queen of Lions. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. And if you're brand new here on this channel, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe because I make brand new videos every single day. Uh, don't forget to ring the notification bell, bell to when I upload so that you guys will not miss an upload. And as always, please roll the outro because I'm out of here and I'll be catching you all in the next video. So peace out, people. And as always, I'll be seeing you all in the next video.